Dr. Gilchrist, and I am re-recording your uh, Lecture 32. So the last time we were here with Lecture 31, we spent some time giving an overview of the different types of mood disorders and talking about some of the different factors, uh, including biological factors with neurotransmitter systems, as well as environmental factors. Um, that can lead to uh, a greater likelihood of a mood disorder. But for now, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the different genetic factors. So I mentioned in the last lecture that there is no depression gene. Typically, uh, for something as complex as a mood disorder, multiple genes are probably going to be involved, and they also have to interact with the environment in very specific ways. Um, one chromosome that has been particularly interesting uh, for researchers is uh, the G, uh, chromosome 17 gene that codes for a serotonin reuptake transporter. So uh, a gene is a segment of DNA that codes for a particular protein. Genes have two different alleles, one on each DNA strand, and these can come in different forms. Um, for chromosome 17 and this particular gene, um, generally, if you have long alleles, so if you have long variations of these alleles, you are less likely to develop uh, a mood disorder. However, if you have one or two short alleles, um, research has found that you will typically have more serotonin in the synapse. Now, typically, when you have more serotonin in the synapse, your brain will basically downregulate or cut the number of receptors for serotonin, so that way you're not getting too much. So it's almost as if you become less sensitive to that serotonin. So because there's more serotonin circulating because the reuptake transporter isn't working properly, the serotonin receptors will cut their numbers and that will make somebody with this disability less responsive to serotonin. So how does all of this work? Well, there's a pretty well-known study that looks at the relationship between the type of alleles that you have and the environment that you are exposed to. This is based off of a study by Cassie and colleagues in uh, the journal Science in 2003. And so what you're kind of looking at here are the three different allele variations. So somebody can have two long alleles, they can have a short allele and a long allele, or they can have two short alleles. Now, genes are only going to work in a very specific sort of environment. So if you have a predisposition to a mood disorder, but you're not necessarily in an environment that turns on that gene and uh, engages in protein production, you may not necessarily develop depression. So Cassie and colleagues wanted to look at the relationships and the interactions that this gene has with the environment. So what you're looking at on your x-axis is uh, different types of treatment. So here we have no maltreatment in the environment, probable maltreatment, um, basically, somebody who's been exposed to abuse, like being ignored, harsh criticism, physical abuse. If it's probable maltreatment, it's less severe. If it's severe maltreatment, it's obviously pretty severe. And then on your y-axis, you have the probability of a major depressive episode. Now, here's what's interesting. It's regardless of what type of allele that you have, if you are in an environment that does not have that maltreatment, you're not very likely, it's maybe only about a one-third chance of developing depression at some point in your life. Um, and if you have those two long alleles, you can see that there's a bit of a protective factor there. No matter how bad the environment gets, people with two long alleles have about the same probability of developing uh, a depressive episode regardless. And where this gets more interesting is the gene-environment interaction. So as maltreatment increases in severity, we see an increased likelihood of developing depression based on the alleles that you have. So somebody with one short allele is going to have an increasing likelihood of developing uh, a depressive episode, but not to the extent that somebody with two short alleles does. So um, this 
is this is not as simple as you have a mutation in a gene and you're going to get depression. It's just correlated. It makes something more likely, but not necessarily destiny. So this uh, basically shows complex gene by environment interactions that can not only be found for depression, but a lot of different psychological disorders. And this is one of the first studies to show that kind of interaction. And this is part of the reason that treatment can be difficult. You can fix the biology, possibly, but if you can't really fix the environment that somebody's in, treatment might be incredibly difficult. So let's talk about a few uh, other genetic factors that might play a role. Uh, first could be uh, somebody having an overexpression of the gene that codes for monoamine oxidase. The monoamine oxidase is an enzyme that breaks down monoamines. That includes dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. So if you have too much of this enzyme circulating through your system, it means that you break down uh, neurotransmitters like norepinephrine and serotonin very easily, which means they don't stay in the synapse for very long and they can't really exert their effects. So that could be another possibility. However, it doesn't fully explain depression. Um, we talked about this with sociopathy. Those that have sociopathy uh, have also been suggested that they have an overexpression of this monoamine oxidase gene. They tend to have underactive monoamines in general, including serotonin, and that might explain why um, they're more likely to engage in, in aggression. But of course, depressed people aren't sociopaths, and sociopaths may not necessarily be depressed. So there's probably some more complex interactions here as well. It's not as simple as one gene per disorder. So now let's talk about some of the different brain abnormalities that can result because of depression. Um, now I say that they can result because of depression, but it's entirely possible that we have a chicken or egg situation possible that these brain abnormalities preceded the depression and made it more likely as well. So obviously there's a lot more work we need to do. One of the more notable findings is that relative to people who are not depressed, um, for people who are undergoing a major depressive episode or they're prone to depression, research has actually found that the hippocampus um, its volume is actually reduced by about 8%. Um, so this loss of hippocampal neurons is actually found in some depressed individuals, and it does actually strongly correlate with impaired memory capacity. Um, so generally, we do find that drugs can increase serotonin levels in the brain, and that might stimulate neurogenesis uh, particularly in the dentate gyrus, and thus increase the total mass of the hippocampus. And it might help to restore mood and memory. Now, this does not mean that hippocampal atrophy causes depressive symptoms. It could, but it also could be a consequence of depressive symptoms. And some of the best evidence that we have for this is, again, going back to our HPA axis. If you are struggling with depression, you are probably dealing with quite a bit of stress in your life. And because of that, that could lead to an overactive HPA axis, leading to potential hippocampal cell death and a loss of hippocampal neurons. Um, now, what's kind of interesting is that while this, um, things like SSRIs have been found to enhance hippocampal volume, we don't really see a reduced hippocampal volume in people with bipolar disorder, um, and we're not entirely sure why. It's possible that manic episodes may either spare the hippocampus or maybe all of that energy fosters activity and growth. We're not really sure. Now, one of the other things that we find is that depressed patients have an overactive amygdala and an overactive orbitofrontal cortex. In fact, it might, may be as much as 50 to 75% more active. Given the relationship between the amygdala and emotional processing, 
especially to negative or threatening information, this makes a lot of sense. So the overactivity that we see in the amygdala may contribute to increased feelings of anxiety and negativity. Um, and this is positively correlated with depression severity. So the more active this is, the more severe your depression might be. And by the way, you are looking at a PET scan. These warmer colors mean areas of greater activity, and you can see greater activity in the amygdala and then in the area that is the orbitofrontal cortex. So we know why the amygdala might be overactive, but what's the deal with the orbitofrontal cortex? Well, remember that it's the job of the orbitofrontal cortex to inhibit the amygdala and keep it in check. And it's possible that the overactivity of the orbitofrontal cortex may actually be an attempt to inhibit the amygdala because this area is involved in inhibiting or regulating strong emotional responses. So the pattern that we kind of see here is that the limbic system plays a very powerful role in mood disorders. So now we're going to move on to talk about different biological treatments. Now, given the wide range of potential causes of depression and the various symptoms that people have, not every treatment is going to be equally effective for every person. Um, there are different forms of mood disorders. People show different types of symptoms. And because of that, treatment can be really difficult. Um, for the two major mood disorders, um, major depression or unipolar depression and bipolar depression, um, there are several common biological treatments. That includes MAOIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, tricyclic antidepressants, and SNRIs, serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, SRIs, electroconvulsive therapy, sleep deprivation, which we've talked about, and the lithium for bipolar disorder. Now, generally, anytime that you are taking a medication for a mood disorder, um, many of the drugs will take several days and in some cases, several weeks to have an effect. Some drugs can take up to uh, four to six weeks to actually have their full effect. And that's partially because the half-life um, grows with time and the metabolism of the drug slows down a bit. Um, so it actually builds up in the brain. Now, people need to be made aware of this period because Patients may feel that the drugs really aren't working, it might make them more depressed, and they might stop taking them as a result. So that's something to keep in mind. So we're going to start by talking about MAOIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So their job is to basically inhibit the enzyme that breaks down monoamines, um, things like dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. So you can see here, we've got a molecule of monoamine oxidase. The inhibitor attaches to that, so it can't really break down these molecules of serotonin. So because of that, um, it's an agonist. It enhances the effect of all of the monoamines, dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. Um, a couple of different examples of monoamine oxidase inhibitors include phenylzine, which is sold as Nardo, Selagoline, uh, uh, which is l depernil or MSAM, those are pretty common. Um, generally, you have to worry about a couple of major side effects with MIOIs. They can be really dangerous. Because you're enhancing the effects of norepinephrine in addition to serotonin and dopamine, you are running the risk of high blood pressure. That's especially true if you are eating a lot of foods rich in tyramine. So tyramine is an amino acid. You can find it in aged cheeses, wine, yeasty bread, and it basically causes monoamines to leak from vesicles. So by facilitating and enhancing norepinephrine in combination with the effects of MAOIs, people have to avoid tyramine-rich foods, so no wine, no cheese, no bread, um, or else they will develop very high blood pressure. Um, interestingly enough, tyramine-rich foods can have an effect on increased headache due to high blood pressure, and migraine sufferers are actually told to try to avoid these. Now, despite this, some people actually respond really well to monoamine uh, oxidase inhibitors. 
And generally that will be because they don't just have issues with serotonin. They might also have low norepinephrine and uh, low, uh, low dopamine as well. And if that's the case, a non-selective drug may be the best thing if they can handle the side effects. Um, and there will be side effects. The more neurotransmitters that a drug works on, the more side effects you'll see. It's part of the reason why we usually start people on a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor first, because that works on one neurotransmitter and only one. So there are fewer side effects there. So now we're going to talk about the tricyclic and the SNRIs. Um, so a couple of examples of tricyclics include um, Elevil, Anaphronel, and Norclamin. So those are tricyclics. SNRIs include drugs like Prestique, Cymbalta, and Astor. Um, these uh, drugs will block serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake uh, transporters. Now, because they're only working on two monoamines rather than three, they're more selective than MALIs. They'll have fewer side effects, and they tend to be preferred. Um, generally, again, you have because it works on norepinephrine, you have to avoid tyramine-rich foods. No cheese, no alcohol, and frankly, you shouldn't be having alcohol with antidepressants anyway. It will enhance the effect. Um, cured meat. Anything that has tyramine in it, when you're taking an SNRI, you should avoid. Other side effects include restlessness and high heart rate or tachycardia. And generally, we're going to find that SNRIs work better for people that have low energy along with low mood. Um, these are generally going to be the newer ones on the market. But by and large, if you develop depression, the very first drug, if you are given a medication, will probably be a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So what you're looking at here is a mechanism of action for fluoxetine. Um, fluoxetine is better known as Prozac. And so how it kind of works is this. So we have serotonin being released into the synapse. The reuptake transporter will basically uh, cycle serotonin back into the presynaptic cell. Now, in cases of people who have depression, it's possible that the reuptake transporter is picking this up too quickly so that serotonin can't have an effect. Prozac or fluoxetine basically will act to block this reuptake transporter so that serotonin can have more of an effect in the synapse. So selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are one of the most well-known prescription drugs they are the most widely described or prescribed types of antidepressants. And they're generally going to be more popular than other antidepressants because they have fewer side effects. They just work on serotonin. Um, so some of the more common side effects of um, SSRIs include weight gain and drowsiness. And those are both associated with the fact that serotonin inhibits the hypothalamus um, and reduces sympathetic action. Um, in addition, you will see a reduced sex drive or libido, and that will largely be because of the effects of serotonin on uh, the amygdala and the limbic system and the nucleus accumbens. Now, some common SSRIs, um, in addition to fluoxetine or Prozac, paroxetine or Paxil, and sertraline or Zoloft, the newer ones that we have are Citalopram, which is Celexa, Escitalopram or Lexapro, and Fluvoxamine or Luvox. So all of these are SSRIs. They can be pretty effective for adults. Um, usually, I think it's been reported that maybe only about 30% report effectiveness. So it's not great, but it can work. Um, but there is a bit of controversy as to whether they should be prescribed for children and young adults. Um, and the reason for this is that brains of children and young adults are still developing, including uh, the serotonin pathways, the frontal lobe, and the limbic system, and SSRIs affect all of those things. Um, are they addictive? They can be. Um, you can develop what's called serotonin syndrome, where you basically, if you try to withdraw, it can be very, very difficult. Um, you can develop things like depression, insomnia, irritability, 
possibly worst case scenario, even suicidal thoughts. So if you're thinking about going off of SSRIs, please check with your doctor and come up with a plan um, that allows you to do that safely. Don't ever quit them cold turkey. So let's talk about electroconvulsive therapy. Now in this particular case, um, this is only going to be used if you have depression and medication has not helped, what we would basically call pharmacologically intractable. Now, in these particular cases, it sounds really scary. Um, we actually anesthetize the patient. We used to not do this. Um, and this was actually used to treat schizophrenia as well. It was first used in the 1930s, very highly used on the point of being overused in the 1950s and the 1960s. And it basically originated from the idea that epilepsy and schizophrenia were antagonistic to one another. And so the idea was that you could alleviate schizophrenia by basically inducing a seizure. Obviously, we know that this is not true. Um, typically, um, patients will be given a cholinergic antagonist like Carare to basically paralyze the muscles and prevent dislocation. And part of the reason that we give you anesthetic is because um, when your muscles are being paralyzed because of the Carare, that can be really scary. So it basically scares you from being scared like that. Um, the mechanism of how this works is unknown. Um, is it possible that where that this activity increases neurotransmitter release or increases the brain growth factor? We don't really know. Um, but we do know that there are a lot of side effects. Um, generally, um, memory loss and confusion is pretty common. Um, there is some retrograde amnesia, typically for weeks or for months. Um, it may come back, but not always. There might be some anterograde amnesia as well about 29 to 50% may experience permanent loss. Um, patients report that it's not unpleasant, but some people really don't like it. It's hard to find good stats on the effectiveness. It can have an immediate effect, but remission is um, very likely. Um, it's generally not believed to cause brain damage, at least from the low levels that we give today, but it can, worst case scenario, develop a brain bleed because of the massive release of neurotransmitters and proteins, and that may cause damage to neurons in areas like the hippocampus. So now we're going to talk about lithium, which is a treatment for mania. Lithium is a light metal. It's in the sodium family, and it was a experimented with from the late 1800s, originally to treat gout, but then it also became a treatment for psychosis and mania. And generally, it's meant to deal with the manic episodes. Researchers at the time believed that depressive episodes um, were partially due to the effect of the mania. So once the manic episodes ended, uh, you were losing all of that brain activity, and that might make one feel depressed. So the idea behind lithium is that if you can regulate the mania, you can alleviate the depression. Um, and sometimes it is used in combination with antidepressants. Um, one, this is a drug that we don't fully understand well. Um, it can work. We're not entirely sure how it works. It may raise membrane thresholds so that it becomes harder to activate neurons. Um, but we do know that there are some side effects. First of all, lithium can be a bit dangerous. It does have a very uh, narrow therapeutic index, which means that there's not much difference between a safe dose and a lethal dose. And some pretty common side effects include tremors, weight gain, excessive urine production, thirst, nausea, motor problems, um, and in higher doses, confusion and coma. Um, so with those side effects and the fact that a lot of people really like their manic episodes, um, really the number one goal for people with bipolar disorder is making sure they take their medication. So now we're going to talk about schizophrenia, and that's what I focus on in Lecture 33. But I'll start with a brief overview of schizophrenia. Schizophrenia comes from the Greek for a split mind. 
not because of split personality, but because of a split from reality. And you may know that this disorder is often confused in popular culture with dissociative identity disorder, previously known as multiple personality disorder. Um, MP DID is completely different. So dissociative identity disorder is not the same as schizophrenia. It's a pretty controversial diagnosis. And depending on who you talk to, there's no scientific basis for it. But in the case of schizophrenia, um, it may have actually been written about in ancient texts from various parts of the world um, until about the 1700s when symptoms that are similar to what are seen today were prescribed and described by uh, physicians. And typically what we'll find with schizophrenia is disorganized and delusional thinking, disturbed perceptions of reality, so things like hallucinations. Schizophrenia was actually one of the targets of the eugenics movement in the early 1900s. That was something that not only the Nazis did, but it also happened here in the United States and in other countries too. Uh, a lot of people who were diagnosed with schizophrenia were forcibly sterilized along with other uh, people with mental illnesses or developmental illnesses like Down syndrome. It tends to occur in 1% of the population at some point in their life, uh, equal, equally between men and women, suggesting this has a pretty strong genetic link. It's 10 times more prevalent in the Western Hemisphere. It occurs in two up to 10% of the homeless. The onset is about late 20s. They have a slightly reduced life expectancy and a slightly increased risk of suicide. Contrary to popular belief, they are not particularly violent. Um, alcoholism is actually linked to more acts of violence than uh, disorders like schizophrenia are. So we'll talk some more about schizophrenia in the next lecture.